For an empire that collapsed more than 1,500 years ago, ancient Rome maintains a powerful presence. About a billion people speak languages derived from Latin. Roman law shapes modern norms. Roman architecture has been widely imitated. Christianity remains the world's largest religion. Yet all of these enduring influences pale against Rome's most important legacy, its fall. Had its empire not unraveled, the world would not have become modern. Now, there's a lot to elaborate on there, but that caught my eye. And for my listeners, let's start out with a brief tutorial. How cataclysmic was the fall of Rome for the world? It was certainly not fun for the people involved. Rome had been around for hundreds of years. It had covered most of Europe, parts of Asia, North Africa. It unraveled in the course of just a few decades, and it never came back. It would have been a very disruptive event for most people on the ground, especially for the ruling class that pretty much disappeared. Common people might have noticed to varying degrees, depending on whether they were being attacked by invaders, by Germans or others, or left alone. But it did actually make a big difference. And it was a process that then went on for generations and centuries as the remains of Roman power, of Roman ways of organizing things faded away. Now, this is, I'm going to jump right into a big part of your piece. How did Europe get so lucky not to have another empire and thus foster all of the innovation, exploration, and and Western society as we know it, had Rome not fallen, we would have never been where we are today, at least as far as Western democracies are concerned. That's certainly certainly my argument, because large empires don't usually foster liberties or democracies or even sustainable economic development. And so the fall of Rome and the fact that nothing like the Roman Empire ever came back really made a critical difference in that part of the globe and then ultimately worldwide. Why did Europe get so lucky? Well, that's a very good question. It may be that the Roman Empire itself was anomalous, that that part of the world doesn't really support large empires because of its geography, its ecology, the fractured nature uh, of the European subcontinent that may have something to do with it. And then uh, if you look at the post-Roman period, the Roman institutions fade quite thoroughly. Rulers become weaker over time. They're unable to hold on to their territories, count and tax their people. And that goes on for a really long time. And in other parts of the world, empires, when they fell, which happened all the time, if you think of China or India, the Middle East, something like that would always come back. And that's the real difference between Europe and all the others. So I think it's a mixture of geography and very specific cultural developments in the wake of the fall of Rome. I'll I'll just, uh, this is not meant to be completely trite, but is it because of Europe's incapacity to organize incompetence to pick up the Roman bureaucracy that actually was a silver lining for Western civilization? That's certainly true. The Germans who came in after the Romans were not very interested in maintaining (laughs) expensive bureaucracies or expensive courts or tax collectors and all these things. They ran government light. And that worked reasonably well, uh, unless what you wanted was to rebuild a huge empire, which some of them tried but never could actually pull off because they lacked the, the infrastructure, the, the organization the Romans had laboriously built up over hundreds of years. Talking here with uh, Professor Walter Scheidel. He is a uh, professor of humanities and classics and history, a fellow at the Human Biology Grossman School at Stanford University. His latest book is The Great Leveler, Violence in the History of Inequality from the Stone Age to the 21st Century, and he's joining us here on WDLS. Was it the fractured nature of Europe post-Roman Empire that allowed for the expansion overseas? The Chinese had that opportunity but did not uh, take it. That's very true, and that's a very good counterexample. China was much richer, much wealthier, had a much bigger navy, much better technology than the Europeans did at the end of the Middle Ages. And yet the Chinese courts, with one exception, were not really interested in overseas ventures. And that made a, that made a lot of sense. If you're the Chinese emperor, you rule 100, 150 million people. There's nothing to be gained from striking out. If, on the other hand, you are in Portugal or in the Netherlands or in Britain and there are just one or two or three million people and you're competing with all the neighboring European states, you have a very strong incentive to to find resources somewhere else. You are hemmed in in Europe itself, so you might as well cross the Atlantic in search for trade, in search for silver, in search for gold. Professor, we're talking here in positive terms about the breakup of the Roman Empire and the fractured nature of Europe and 
uh, the kingdoms there and the, 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 the fractured church and what have you, and the expansion, the Columbian Exchange, what have you, is that still allowed in 2021? You have to be very delicate about that. The, the last 500 years are full of horrors, right? There's no doubt about it, right? The Europeans, because they were so fragmented, we get very, very good at waging war against others. They get very good at exploiting others. They are very good at going around the world, hitting other people over the head, taking away their stuff, enslaving them, doing the most horrible things imaginable. And yet at the same time, the same 500 years, see unprecedented innovation right, in the domains of science, technology, uh, uh, political uh, arrangements, economic development. And those things seem to be tied together, whether we like it or not, which is not to justify any of the horrible things that happened. But all these developments are very, very closely intertwined. And they're all driven one way or another by European fragmentation. Professor, how were scientists and thinkers able to steer clear of the church during this era? It certainly helps that you have a bunch of kingdoms. They all compete. They all have slightly attitudes towards the Pope. And then, of course, in the 16th century, the Reformation takes off. that really uh, splits Europe into two major factions, Northern Europe, where development then takes off more rapidly uh, under the Protestants and the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church farther um, south. And that's the kind of fission you don't really see in similar ways, again, in other parts um, of the world, where the religious authorities uh, would be much more closely allied in a more reliable way to the secular authorities. So you have no division of church and state. You have an alliance of people at the top, whether it's kings or warriors or large landlords or priests. They're all sort of in the same camp, right? And they all conspire to keep people down and exploit them. And all the top people in Europe would have liked to do the same thing. It's just they couldn't quite pull it off because all of these, because of all these multiple fractures that would appear and not go away and actually get worse over time. So just to double back, in other words, the fractured nature of Europe post uh, Roman Empire actually worked to the advantage because it, it, uh, it, uh, it demanded innovation and it demanded new thinking and it demanded expansion and it demanded competition with all the negatives that come with that. We've already covered that, obviously. But you also said towards the end of your piece, uh, Professor, that we got very, very lucky because of an asteroid. Can you, uh, can you elaborate on that? Well, the first lucky break that humans uh, experienced was 66 million years ago, right? When the, when the dinosaurs were wiped out because had the dinosaurs been around for longer, the mammals could not have taken off the way they did and we would not be sitting here. We'd still be rodents, right? <laughs> Running around and trying to you know, escape from the dinosaurs. And in a way, the fall of the Roman Empire is an echo of this. It's the second lucky break that we caught. You have a gigantic system that lords it over one part of the world. It collapses, it goes away, it never comes back, just like the dinosaurs, and sets a different way of doing things free, right? Makes that possible, just as mammals were set free by the fall of the dinosaurs. You wrote that had the Roman Empire persisted, we would all likelihood be plowing our fields, living in poverty, and dying young. That's what people had been doing for thousands of years. There was no obvious reason this would ever change. And most likely it would not have changed by now, maybe in some distant future, but certainly not yet. There was no clear trajectory out of that traditional way of life. How are things in New York City this afternoon? They are very pleasant. Things are looking up. Are you, uh, are you able to get out and uh, enjoy the city now or still is it pretty much locked down? No, no, everything is opening up. You have indoor dining and maybe the mask mandate is going to be relaxed. We'll, we'll find out after today's CDC announcement and vaccination rates are going up. And for the first time in a year, it looks really, um, you know, there is some hope in the air. Well, I must say my father-in-law was a big fan of your book. It's sitting on his uh, or in his bookshelf upstairs. The Great Leveler, Violence in the History of Inequality from the Stone Age to the 21st Century. I promise that I will crack that and uh, read it as soon as possible. Do you recommend that I, I delve into uh, Gibbons, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, or is that just too, too much to bite off this late in life for me? Well, what I would recommend is to read the 700-page version of my essay, right, Escape from Rome, where I uh, present my argument in perhaps exhausting uh, detail, trying to make the case. It really was the fall of the Roman Empire that made a real difference in world history. Well, I, I thought this was terrific. 
and we will uh, uh, send it out over social media. I recommend to all my listeners that they read it. It's really, really interesting and very, very witty as well. Professor, thanks for your time. Much appreciated, sir. Thank you. Thanks for your interest.